Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Phil Howard. I'm director of the Center for Media, Data, and Society here at CU. And it's a, a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, uh, Corey Doctorow. Uh, first, a couple of the usual items of business. Yeah, uh, Please turn your mobile phones off. Um, Corey said he's happy to sign books after the talk. Uh, so if you've uh, bought something, or um, if you're interested in one of the copies of uh, some of his Hungarian, his writing in Hungarian, they're available outside. Our hashtag for tonight um, will be Dr. O at CMDS. Um, Corey, I'm curious, do you tweet while you're talking? Or? No, I, I, but I do have a lot of cute queued up tweets. Queued up tweets. So it's possible we could put that out as a challenge, see if he's actually able to engage with us and tweet while talking. But we'll carry out our own conversation um, perhaps uh, as he goes. And um, there are some sign-up sheets. We have um, events. This is part of a larger speaker series on public policy and the Internet of Things. We have a series of events uh, over the next few months that uh, I'd love to be able to send you more invitations to. So there's some clipboards going around. Um, please sign up uh, if you'd like to get some uh, alerts about what we're up to. So I'll just do a brief introduction uh, to Coy because probably most, most of you have encountered his writings in various ways. Um, I find the, the magic of listening to Coy Doctorow is, that, is in his ability to tie the, the nuances of code and design and law to implications for political culture. He is very good at doing that translational work. And I would bet by, by the end of tonight's talk, you'll get two kinds of things out of him. Um, when I met him 10 years ago at a privacy conference, he taught me that the best way to prevent somebody from ever stealing your laptop was to put stickers on the laptop. And as you can see, I'm still, still doing it. I don't put that as a challenge to you to try to steal my, my laptop, but I, I just mean to say that you'll probably hear bits of software, um, tweaks that you need to do to your email habits, uh, links, websites that you may want to try out for yourself um, that, that will um, provoke you to take more care with how you manage your identity online. And then you'll probably get a big sense of some of the great puzzles that we now face with the Internet of Things, with these new device networks that are emerging. Um, and so with that, I'll introduce Corey. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Thank you all uh, very much. And thank you, Phil, and thank you for bringing me out here again to see you. This is my second visit to Budapest and see you, and uh, it's, I've had a lovely day. Uh, I will start by apologizing uh, to those of you who are not native English speakers and even some of you who are because I am one of nature's fast talkers. Uh, I, for my sins, was an NGO delegate to the United Nations where I was the scourge of the simultaneous translation corps. <laughs> I would stand up and speak as slowly as I knew how and I would turn around to look at the translation booths and to a one the translators would be doing this. <laughs> So I invite you, when I speak too quickly, not if, but when, to raise your hands, and I will slow down. Um, so we live today in a world made out of computers. Uh, we put our bodies into computers. Uh, our houses, a modern house, uh, and a modern office building especially, is a computer that our body cohabitates. Uh, when you remove the computers from modern buildings, buildings with high degrees of insulation and automation, they cease to be habitable almost immediately. And in Florida, when they turn the computers off in the subprime houses that were foreclosed on after uh, the crisis in 2008, what they discovered is that by turning the computers off for an appreciable length of time, the amount of mold and, and uh, decay that set in made those houses permanently uninhabitable. And they had to scrape them to the ground and start over again. In an important sense, the most significant fact about those houses is that they're giant case mods that we happen to live in. Cars are computers, not self-driving cars, but contemporary modern cars. Every year at conferences like DEF CON or CCC, we see people stand up and demonstrate attacks on car informatics using things like the Bluetooth unlocking interface to take control of the brakes or the steering. The most salient fact about your car is its informatics, not its engine. Uh, on a plane 
as a computer. Uh, Boeing 747 is a very fancy flying Sun Solaris workstation in a really, really expensive aluminum case connected to <laughs> extremely badly secured and tragic SCADA controllers. Um, and not only do we keep our bodies inside of computers, increasingly we put computers inside of our bodies. Many of you will know someone who has a pacemaker or an implanted defibrillator, but even more than that, if you're like me and you grew up with a Walkman, or if you're a little younger and you grew up with MP3 players, you will log enough punishing earbud hours that should you live long enough and not be killed by a self-driving car, you will someday get a hearing aid. And that hearing aid is vanishingly unlikely to be an analog retro transistorized beige plastic hearing aid. It will be a computer that you put in your body. And depending on how that computer is configured, it will know what you hear. It may tell other people what you hear. It may stop you from hearing things that are there. And it may make you hear things that aren't there with or without your consent. Uh, I mentioned implanted defibrillators before. Uh, implanted defibrillators are wonderful technology. If you know someone who would have died because their heart is no longer able to sustain its rhythm, today they can go to their doctor and she will cut them open, spread their ribs, and attach a computer with a battery to their heart. And it will listen to their heartbeat. And if their heart stops beating, it will shock them back to life like defibrillator paddles. This is amazing stuff. And of course, Doctors want to read the telemetry off of them, know what they're doing. They want to update the firmware, add new features. And computers that are in your chest cavity are inconvenient to attach USB cables to. <laughs> so they have wireless interfaces. And a few years ago, a researcher now deceased named Barnaby Jack gave a presentation on how from 30 feet away he could compromise the wireless interfaces in implanted defibrillators and cause them to seek out other implanted defibrillators and take them over and then at preset dates administer lethal shocks to all their wearers. Uh, when Dick Cheney had his defibrillator implanted, he had the wireless interface turned off. <laughs> I'm a, a very frequent flyer. I'm changing the climate. Ask me how. And uh, I know that the first rule of the Web Warrior is ABC, always be charging, because your laptop is your lifeline to the world. And so whenever I go into a new room, I automatically scan the baseboards for plugs. And I was in an airport lounge and feeling very smug about having seized the only plug in the room to charge my laptop when a man walked up to me and very cheekily asked me if he could use my plug. And I looked over my glasses at him and said, I'm charging my laptop before the flight. And he rolled up his trouser leg and he showed me the robotic prosthesis that was attached to his leg from the knee down. And he said, I need to charge my leg before the flight. <laughs> and I said, it's all yours. So we live in a world made of computers, where our bodies are inside of computers, and where computers are inside of our bodies. And computers pose new regulatory challenges that are in some ways without precedent in the history of technology regulation. And because computers have become so intrinsic to our condition, our answers to these regulatory questions are some of the most significant questions we have in policy circles today. Now, historically, when a technology was involved with a social problem, we solved that problem with a technology mandate. So for example, radios do a lot of useful social things. They bind us together as a community through radio broadcast. They allow for efficient emergency services dispatch. They are critical to air traffic control. And radio is a very fragile technology. Uh, depending on how a radio emitter and a radio receiver are built, they will or won't work, and they can interfere with each other in ways that are quite dreadful and can render whole classes of devices over very large areas completely unusable. Indeed, the first radio transmitters were things called spark gap generators, which, if you were to operate one today, would effectively render all the radios around you unusable for so long as you insisted on using your big dumb spark gap generator. And the way that we solved that problem was with a mandate. We have in virtually every country in the world a radio regulator. And if you are going to make a device for sale in a country or for import to that country, you are required to give a prototype of that device to the regulator who will inspect it and decide whether or not that radio uh, is designed well to only emit in the bands that it's supposed to emit in and won't interfere with other radio equipment. And although with a lot of effort, 
someone who was skilled as an electronics engineer could re-engineer that radio, could turn a baby monitor into an air traffic control device. That person could also do it just from scratch with parts. Um, and the likelihood that someone would accidentally turn their baby monitor into an air traffic control device is extremely low. But today, our regulatory model for radios has fallen apart because modern radios are software-defined radios. Instead of having a crystal, a quartz crystal whose resonant frequency, whose vibrational frequency determines how that radio emits, today we have an, uh, an oscillator and a, uh, a, a software, a um, signal processing algorithm uh, that, um, uh, and an analog to digital converter or digital to analog converter that determines the characteristics of the radio depending on what software is used in conjunction with them. Which means that by loading new code into your baby monitor, you really can make it into a, uh, uh, an air traffic control device. And so this is an enormous regulatory challenge that we don't really have any answers for. It doesn't really work with computers, this idea of saying before the computer leaves the factory, you have to decide what kind of instructions it will interpret and which ones it won't. And that way we'll solve our social problem. And to explain why, I have to delve into some, into some computer science fundamentals, um, uh, and, and particularly into the idea of Turing completeness. Now, before the Second World War, if you wanted to electronically compute something important, you built a calculator to compute just that thing. So if you wanted to tabulate, tabulate elections, you built an election tabulating machine. If you wanted to calculate ballistics tables, you, cal you built a ballistics table calculating machine. Um, and so the uh, war changed all of that. In, in, during World War II at Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom, a great collection of mathematicians and computer scientists, early computer scientists, led by Alan Turing and particularly assisted by the Polish mathematicians in exile, worked together to create uh, what we think of as the modern computer. And that work was critically augmented by um, what they called the Hungarians, the, the Janusz von Neumann and his colleagues who went to the Princeton Institute and worked on the early computer architecture in, excuse me, in Princeton. And together they designed this computer, this architecture, this revolutionary architecture for computing that we call the von Neumann machine that is Turing complete. And a Turing complete von Neumann machine is a computer that can execute all the instructions that we can express in symbolic logic. Any program that is valid can run on any Turing machine. And every computer that you've used in your life almost certainly was a Turing machine, Turing complete machine. And what that means is that the programs that you're running on computers today that are tens of millions of times more powerful than the, pro than the computers that Turing built, that von Neumann built, would run on those computers. Now, they would run very slowly on those computers. They might take more time than we have left before the universe collapses to run. But they would run. Now, Turing completeness is amazing because it means that instead of designing a new, a new machine every time we need to do a new uh, thing every time we need to do a new calculation. We just load new code onto it. And Turing completeness, once we discovered it, we hardly seem to be able to get away from it. It seems to be kind of almost latent in the structure of the universe. You may know a, a, a collectible card game called Magic the Gathering. Uh, Magic the Gathering, given a large enough deck and the right rule set, is a Turing complete computer. Right? Now you can compute anything you can compute on your laptop with a very large Magic the Gathering deck. Now when I say very large, I do mean a deck that might stretch to the sun and beyond. But a very lar a large enough deck and enough time and you can compute anything on, a Turing, on any Turing machine. Indeed, we try now to build machines that aren't Turing complete and we usually fail. So why would we want to make a Turing incomplete machine? Well, say you've just designed a new social media platform and on your social media platform everybody gets a page and on those pages, they all get a glittery unicorn at the top of the page, a, a GIF, it's pronounced GIF. They get a GIF <laughs> at the top of the page that glitters and animates. And you want to let them have the awesome personal self-expression power of choosing how the unicorn moves. And so you write a toy scripting language that lets the unicorn do three or four really simple things. And you think that's safe. And then inevitably, at a conference like CCC or Black Hat or DEF CON, some programmer stands up and says, I took the two or three instructions that you included and figured out how to build the full Turing complete instruction set out of your toy unicorn animation language, and I wrote a virus in it. <laughs> so this means that computers 
can't be appliances the way we think of computers as appliances. When we say, oh, I've sold you a router, and all it is is a router, and it'll never be a rendering station or a car informatics system, what we mean is it would be like dumb and weird to use it as a rendering station or car informatics. What we don't mean is that it's technically challenging or impossible to use it as that. Um, but firms are under extreme pressure today to tether their devices to ecosystems that they control. They look at Apple's $10 billion, 213, the 2013 App Store revenue, and they say, wouldn't it be great if we could design computers that only read, ran the code that came from our store and not the code that came from other people's stores? Um, the investors that they court, they speak glowingly of businesses that have what they call moats and walls. Uh, where uh, there's some cost that a customer would have to bear to change their loyalty. So if you stop being a user of one ecosystem and start being a customer of another, you find yourself having to uh, throw away all your gear and, and buy all new stuff because it's been designed not to interoperate. And they also want, that's, that's a, a moat, and they want a business, with, or a, mo a wall rather, and they want a business with a moat, and that's a business where it would cost another company a lot of money to come in and compete with you. And so they want to design devices and computers that only talk to the ones that are blessed by them. Now, historically, there has been a kind of economic equilibrium between moats and the rents that they allow the firms who create them to extract uh, them. If, if your customers have to spend $1,000 uh, to replace their printers to get one that uses cheaper ink, then you can charge them about $1,000 over the life of the printer. And on average, they will stick with your printer and not throw it away and buy one that gets cheaper ink, uh, hand-waving aside economic questions about net present value and so on. But generally, um, if, if your computer, uh, if your printer costs a lot more than uh, $1,000 uh, in, in extra value, you would expect your customers maybe to defect to a printer that was $1,000 cheaper and throw away their brand new printer to get another one rather than buy you, but buy all of your extremely expensive ink. So that's normally the, the, the limit on how much rent you can extract from your moat, right? It's what a competitor might come in and offer your customers that would make it a good deal not to buy your very expensive uh, consumable or participate in your very expensive ecosystem. Generally, if you try to lock your customers out of your rival's products, they will just unlock themselves, they, thanks to the uh, miracle of the, of the Turing com completeness of, of the von Neumann architecture. They will just, if you have a program that checks to make sure that uh, all the software running on a phone is blessed by Apple, someone will make a program that makes sure that that first program doesn't run, right? And then they can buy their, their software from anyone, and that's the end of it. Um, now, to understand how that works and why that works and particularly why that doesn't work, we have to talk about, about cryptography for a moment as well as, as computer science foundations. And again, we go back to, to Alan Turing here and the work that he did on cryptography. Um, the, when, when you talk to cryptographers about how crypto works, they, they tend to use examples involving three people, Alice, Bob, and Carol, uh, although today we might say Alice, Bob, and Clapper. And, and Alice and Bob are two friends who trust each other and want to send each other messages. And uh, Carol is their enemy. And Carol wants to read their messages. And cryptographers try to figure out how Alice and Bob can talk to each other without Carol getting in the middle of things. And cryptographers start from certain assumptions. They assume that um, Carol uh, knows that Alice and Bob are sending each other a message because Alice and Bob are probably sending that message over a medium that's a bit noisy, like a radio, where anyone inside the radio's emission zone can, can see that a message is going by, or maybe by satellite, where it blankets a whole continent, or maybe they're using a public switched internet or a phone. Um, and so in all of those cases, we assume that uh, the adversary, Carol, knows the message exists. And we actually assume that she can get the message, that she can receive it in transit. Because if you know it exists, if it's coming from a satellite, if it's being uh, sent, blanketed over a whole continent, then it's not hard for Carol to get a copy of that message. So Carol has the scrambled message. Alice and Bob also assume that Carol knows how they scrambled it. The reason Carol uh, will know how uh, Alice and Bob scrambled it is because we don't know how to make security systems uh, whose uh, security is provable by any methodology other than telling other people how they work. 
Um, before we had science, we had a thing that looked a lot like science called uh, alchemy. And alchemists were all engaged in similar labor. They wanted to convert base materials into precious ones. And they had a kind of weird game theoretical outcome because if you figured out how to turn lead into gold, uh, and then all the other alchemists got the secret from you, then gold would become worthless and all of your life's work would be wasted. So alchemists didn't tell each other what they thought they'd learned. And human beings have like a bottomless capacity for self-deception, which is very hard to check when you don't tell anyone else what you think you know. And as a consequence, alchemists all discovered for themselves in the hardest way possible that drinking mercury was a very bad idea. <laughs> And so alchemy stalled out, right? We didn't, get, we didn't get any kind of advance on the alchemical project until alchemists started publishing. And we, we call the period before alchemists published the Dark Ages, we call the period when they started publishing the Enlightenment. And like every other discipline of the Enlightenment, the only way to know if security works is through peer review, right? There is no security in obscurity for the same reason that there is no physics in obscurity. If you don't tell other people what you think you know, you're probably kidding yourself. So Alice and Bob, having learned the lesson of Alan Turing's adversaries, who had secret ciphers that Alan Turing broke, along with the Poles and the Hungarians, uh, and continued to send messages in these broken ciphers and got all their U-boats sunk, uh, having learned that lesson, they've told everyone that they can find how their cipher works so that all of the dumb mistakes they make can be corrected because anyone can design a security system that works against people stupider than them. And they want to make one that works on people smarter than them. So Carol knows what Alice and Bob have done to scramble the message. Carol has the message. So how are Alice and Bob to attain secrecy? Well, uh, Alice and Bob have a key. And when they run the message through the algorithm with the key, it gets scrambled in a way that can't be descrambled unless you also have the key. And the maths of the crypto are strong and good and have withstood peer scrutiny, and we believe they work. Um, we, we, we believe in a really foundational way that they work. Uh, and um, that means that you can give Carol the message. And so long as you never give her the key, it doesn't matter. So how does it work when you try to stop someone from running software that they want on a device that they own in this crypto model. So I want you to be able to play DVDs, but I don't want you to be able to rip DVDs, right? Uh, I just want you to be able to play them in the optical drive on your computer. Or I want you to be able to download Netflix and watch it once, but not save it to watch later. Um, how do we make that work? Well, we give you a player, right? We give you the Netflix player, we give you a DVD player. And that player has an algorithm. It's a good algorithm. It's one that you know, is published, widely understood. And that player um, has the scrambled movie. That's what Netflix sends you or what you brought home from the store on your DVD. And that player has the key. And so long as you never find out what the key is, you can't design a piece of software that decodes the DVD. Right? Well, you may have spotted the problem with this. Because you are Carol but you're also Alice. Bob has sent you the key because you're Alice, you're supposed to read the message, but Bob hopes that you don't have the key because you're Carol and you're not supposed to be able to read the message unless you're doing it in the way that Bob says so. And anybody in the world can be Alice, right? All you need to do to be Alice is get a Netflix subscription, buy a DVD player. Bored grad students with the weekend off and electron tunneling microscopes are Alice. Right? And we have hidden the key somewhere in a piece of equipment that we let Alice take home with her. And we hope that she'll never figure out where we hid it. This doesn't work for the same reason that we don't keep even really good bank safes in bank robbers' living rooms. Right? Because if you have it on your equipment, on your premises, it won't work. Um, uh, so, why do we still have it? How does it work? That how is, how is it that we have Netflix, that we have iTunes, that we have iPhones, and so on? Well, we swallow spiders to catch that fly. Uh, there is a meshwork of global treaties that began in 1996 with two UN WIPO treaties, the WCT and the WPPT, and then turned into global uh, uh, laws and directives like the 2001 EUCD, 
the American uh, uh, DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998, and Canada's recent Bill C-11. All of those laws uh, endeavor to protect this weird Alice, Bob, and Carol business model, uh, these walled gardens. Uh, in the name of preventing privacy, they make it a felony to produce a tool that circumvents effective means of access control. That is, if you do anything that assists people in doing things that the manufacturer, manufacturer has prohibited, you commit a felony. Now, it doesn't actually stop people from creating software to jailbreak their devices. They still do that. Um, but, it, but the fact that they can't do that um, in a way that is open and in a way that uh, allows them to raise capital and market products and put adverts on the sides of buses means that um, the industry that uses these digital locks can still maintain uh, a source of secondary income from them, for themselves by uh, depriving users of features that the law would allow, but that um, uh, they're not allowed to add because they have to break the digital lock to get there. So a, a good example of this is CDs and DVDs. Uh, if you buy a CD and you bring it home and you own a fruit-flavored laptop, Apple will give you a free program whose slogan is Rip, Mix, Burn, called iTunes, and it will do something totally legal. It will rip your CD, and it'll stick it right on your iPhone. Now, if you own a DVD, which is read in the same drive, and is made in the same factory, and can be uh, organized with your copy of iTunes, it would be a felony to give you a copy of a program that would let you rip it to your computer and stick it on your iPhone. Instead, you're supposed to buy that DVD again as a download from the iTunes store. And so for companies that would like to sell you something you already own, a prohibition on breaking digital locks is a great way to make more money. Right? It, 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 it's, a, it's a way to take the surplus value latent in your property and um, take it in for themselves. So um, uh, you can um, imagine that if you had $1,000 worth of CDs and $1,000 worth of DVDs in 1996, that um, today those DVDs can only do what they could do when you bought them. You can, just, you can just watch them, which is amazing when you think of a technology where no new features have been added since 1996. That's a, that's a shocking thing, right? Um, but CDs, because you can rip them, they're alarm tones and ring tones. You can mash them up and back them up and stream them and give them to your friends. And you can put them as background music in your YouTube videos and do a million things. All that latent value that used to be in your, in your CD has now been unleashed because there's no prohibition on giving you a tool that allows you to do legal things with your CDs. The model that digital locks enable, you can think of it as the urinary tract infection business model. So with the CD, all the value flows in a kind of healthy gush. And with the DVD, the value comes in a painful dribble, right? Every time you want to do something new with a DVD, you have to go and buy that right again. Uh, and so um, this is a very, very attractive proposition to industry and to investors, right? They really like this. I had dinner recently with a friend of mine who uh, is an analyst for a VC firm that invests in Western companies doing hardware startups in China. And they said, we're only investing in companies that have an ecosystem, right? Where there's a, a software ecosystem that ties the hardware into a suite of services. Uh, and that suite of services will never be competed with uh, because uh, by an industry, by, by, through investment capital, because it's unlawful to do that. Um, but it's not enough to make it a crime to manufacture products that allow users to jailbreak their devices, because individual users might figure out how to um, get, the, get around this all on their own. Uh, or you might get nonprofit software entities that have different risk profiles and different victory conditions, like uh, VLC, which is based here in Hungary, that circumvent and don't charge anything for it. Uh, and because, of course, as I said, anyone can become Alice by buying your products and scrutinizing it uh, closely. So these laws don't just prohibit firms from producing interoperable products, they criminalize disclosing information that might help you uh, break a digital lock. Uh, they, just, they, they make it a crime to tell you about flaws in the digital lock that can be used to unlock it because that's what individuals need in order to make their own players. That's what VLC relies on in order to make their own players. Now, um, 
that turns the defects in devices that are covered by these anti-circumvention statutes into reservoirs of long-lived vulnerabilities. And those long-lived vulnerabilities threaten our own lives. Because bugs in software aren't just used to jailbreak phones. Your phone is a supercomputer in your pocket that knows everything about you. It knows who your friends are and what you talk to them about and everywhere you go and how to log into your bank account. Um, it has a camera and you take it with you into the toilet and into the bedroom. And it has a microphone that's on potentially while you discuss sensitive things with people around you in the room. Uh, it knows what your doctor emailed you. It knows what you said to your lawyer. Um, and so a vulnerability in your iPhone doesn't just let you break out of Apple's software ecosystem. It also puts you at enormous risk. Um, an Internet of Things world is a world where you are potentially under continuous surveillance. If you think about what a voice-activated system means, it means a system where you are never out of range of a microphone. What a gesture-activated system means is a system where you are never out of range of a camera. And malware authors, the people who attack us through our computers, rely on these same vulnerabilities that are a crime to report under anti-piracy laws. They rely on them to figure out how to subvert devices' security models, so as do, as do spies. And, and any limit on vulnerability disclosure increases the length of time that that vulnerability is live in the field before the, manufactur before the manufacturer can issue a patch for it. Um, and so uh, if you think about what this means for a future of devices that you don't know about, that you're not allowed to know the vulnerabilities in, and that are ever more intimately woven into your life, and where people who discover critical flaws face jail time, as the Russian programmer Dmitry Skilyarov faced when he revealed flaws in Adobe's ebook reader and the FBI put him in jail in America, um, it means that our devices become not honest servants, but potential traitors in every way. And so today, we are already seeing the first steps of that. So um, think of the Euromaidan protests in Kiev. Uh, and they, uh, the old regime was extremely hostile to the uprising in Euromaidan. Uh, and they did what they could to uh, compromise and attack the people who came in, including uh, um, investigating and threatening their families, trying to assemble dossiers on who was sympathetic to the movement, and so on. In America now, there's widespread use of these devices called Stingrays. And a Stingray is a fake cell phone tower that um, briefly pulses all the phones around it and gets them to answer back with something called the IMEI number, which is their unique identifier. And your carrier, which is liable to a subpoena or just a, a straight up attack from the state, your carrier can associate your IMEI with your identity. So imagine if in, uh, in, in uh, Maiden, if rather than having to send secret police and provocateurs around to find out who was throwing the Molotovs or beating the drums or doing all the other things on the, uh, on, on the other side of the line, they could have just pressed a button and gotten the name and address of everybody protesting in the square. And now think forward a couple of years. Uh, we now have these new smart meters going in. Google just bought Nest, which is one of the big smart meter companies. Smart meters are super cool technology. Um, if you, like me, are worried about coal, powered, uh, uh, coal power and climate, uh, one, of these, one of the promises of a smart meter is that it's going to let us minimize our reliance on coal because right now we turn on coal generators when um, the power grid hits peak load. And so that's when we turn on the coal. But there's an alternative to turning on the coal when the power grid hits peak load, which is turning down everyone's thermostat by one degree. And then we don't have to turn on the coal plants. That's great. <coughs> But you can imagine that people who are deploying those systems would think a priori, if we're going to turn down people's thermostats by one degree, we don't want them walking over and turning it back up again. We need to design those thermostats so that they're not under user control, but under remote control, so that the user is treated as an adversary and not the owner of the device. In fact, in most cases, people don't own their thermostats. They're owned by the power company, especially in these smart models. Now, Imagine that the next Maiden is in Minsk, and everyone's got smart meters, and Lukashenko turns on his stingray and gets everyone's address, 
and then presses a button and turns off everyone's heat who showed up for a demonstration in Minsk. Right? The power of the state to exercise coercive force over the citizenry in a world in which we are treated as adversaries to the devices that we live inside of and that are inside of our body is horrific. In America, the collapse of the subprime uh, house industry sent the finance industry ser searching for new things to securitize, new loans to securitize. And the latest securitization mania is for cars. They've started offering subprime loans to, to people who are, aren't good credit risks to buy cars. And they securitize those loans. They generate bonds based on them. And the way that they maintain the value of those bonds, which is contingent on the car payments being made, is by fitting the cars with a networked, uh, remote control, location sensitive ignition override. And if you don't make your payments, your car won't start. And if you have a condition on your lease that says you can't drive out of a certain region, uh, and you drive out of that region, your car won't start. We've already seen the negative consequences of this. Um, there was in the New York Times an account of a woman who uh, had a lease that specified she wouldn't take her car out of her county line, over her county line. And she took her children on a trip to the woods, just over the county line, outside of mobile phone reception. And she turned her car off, and they walked in the woods, and they walked back to the car, and the car wouldn't start, and they had no mobile phone reception because they were on the wrong side of the county line. Uh, their car, need, they needed to speak to the insurance company, the, the, car, the finance company, to restart their car. When you imagine how that would work when it's not accidental but deliberate, the um, risks seem very large. Not only that, but if um, Congress was willing to give the entertainment industry a statute that says it's a felony to show someone how to listen to music on an unapproved device, what will Congress make of the YouTube videos that are already there explaining how to remove the, the uh, uh, override from your car. They're going to go to Congress and say, why can't we have a law that says it's illegal to show someone how to steal a car if it's illegal to show someone how to listen to music the wrong way? And so we can expect that this doctrine will have enormous pressure to expand. And where it ends is anyone's guess. But I saw a presentation a few years ago from Hugh Hare who is the head of the MIT Media Lab's Prosthetics Laboratory. And Hare gives an amazing presentation. He uses slides, which I am in awe of, because I can't use slides. And he shows all these slides of these amazing things that his lab has done. And then the last slide is a picture of him. And he's clinging to a rock uh, in Gore-Tex. And he's rock climbing. And he has no legs. He has prosthetics. And he's been walking up and down the stage this whole time, a little lavalier mic. And he says, oh, didn't I mention? And he rolls his pants legs up. And he's lost both his legs to frostbite. He's a robot from the knee down. And, he's been, and then he starts jumping up and down the stage like a mountain goat. It is the coolest demo I've ever seen. <laughs> and the first question anyone asked was, how much are those legs? And he named a price that like, you could buy a brownstone in the Lower East Side for it, or you know, a house in Mayfair. right? And then the next question was, who can afford those legs? And he said, well, anyone, right? If it's a 40-year mortgage on a house or a 60-year mortgage on legs, you're going to take the legs. Well, we already have seen in subprime auto what repossession looks like, right? What does repossession look like when it's your legs? Now, worryingly, the world's security services have hit on a strategy for cybersecurity capability that's all, offense, all offense and no, no defense. The Snowden revelations included the news that GCHQ and the NSA collaborate on programs that are, depending on which side of the ocean you're on, called Bull Run or Edge Hill, which cost $250 million a year, that are devoted to deliberately introducing vulnerabilities into our devices so that they can be used to attack their adversaries. Uh, including subverting standards like the National Institute for Standards and Technologies cryptography random number generator, their elliptical curve random number generator, which is a shocking turn of affairs. It's like discovering that the security services have been secretly mixing sand into all the concrete so they can make buildings fall down if they need to. Right? Uh, your building, remember, is just as uninhabitable without its IT as it is without its structural supports. So um, in addition to this, 
many of the world's governments have started to buy vulnerabilities from security researchers. Historically, security researchers who discovered vulnerabilities disclosed them to the manufacturers. In fact, they forced the manufacturers to respond to them. It used to be you would go to Microsoft and say, I found a critical bug in Windows. And they'd say, OK, whatever. Right? And you go back like six months later and you say, haven't you guys fixed that? And they go, we're busy. And now what hackers do is they go to Microsoft and they say, we found a bug in your software. We've had a paper accepted about it at a conference next month. You better fix it before then. Except there's another thing you can do if you find a vulnerability now, which is you can sell it to the spies. And they will weaponize it. And they will use it to attack us. And if the spies have a vulnerability that they're using to attack their enemies, that vulnerability is also there to be discovered by criminals and voyeurs and other bad guys who can come and use them to attack us. Um, this week, uh, Cameron, uh, uh, David Cameron, the Tory Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, where I live, uh, as you can tell by my accent, uh, he, uh, he said we should have no means of communication that we cannot read. And the FBI and the New York Attorney General have gone on record saying that they would like mandates for backdoors on phones uh, that do full disk encryption and have encrypted, encrypted protocols to talk to one another. But, as we saw with Alice and Bob and Carol, if your computer has a program that is un insecure, right, it, it has a back door, the only way for that back door to subsist once you know it's there is for it to be impossible for you to install a better program on your computer. When the FBI says, we don't want you, we want um, a back door in the operating system of your phone, what they mean is, we don't want you to be able to change the operating system of your phone. That is absolutely necessary as a precondition for you to, uh, to, to uh, for them to be able to backdoor your phone. And as we saw with Alice, Bob, Carol, and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the only way to preserve that is to make it a felony for you to know about vulnerabilities that would allow you to install a, um, a, a better software on your phone. So even if you trust the secret police in your country, um, what it means is that the vulnerabilities in your phone are going to take much longer for you to know about. And you may be compromised, like, say, Cassidy Wolf, the former Miss Teen USA, who last year had someone install drive-by malware on her phone, which he used to hijack her camera and keyboard, took incidental nude photos of her as she walked around in her room, and then uh, demanded by email live sex shows from her uh, in front of the camera that he'd now taken control of, or he would use the social media passwords he'd harvested to put those nude photos all over the internet. She called the FBI, who arrested him, and found that he had over 140 victims around the world, including minor children in the EU. That's what it means to not know if there's a backdoor, a vulnerability, lurking in your device. Now, the NSA is not the Stasi. Uh, the modern world does exist in a state of constant surveillance and the Snowden revelations, which encompassed full feed captures of major internet trunk lines, mass harvesting of data from enormous online services like Google and Facebook, and the deliberate introduction of flaws into operating systems and devices shocked many of us. In Europe, especially in the former Soviet states, we like to draw comparisons to the surveillance habits of the Stalin security agencies like the Stasi. But a cursory look at the figure shows that this is a remarkably inapt comparison. At its peak in 1989, the Stasi operated in a largely pre-internet, pre-computer era, and really had a hard job of it spying on people. In 1989, there were about 16 million people in the GDR, and there were 294,000 operatives of one kind or another in the pay of the Stasi, including 173,000 173, unofficial informants, uh, snitches. And today, there are, it's hard to know how big the NSA is, but there's 4 million Americans with any sort of security clearance, 1.4 million of them with top security clearance, and about 7 billion people on Earth. And the US intelligence services, along with the Five Eyes allies in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, and the wider circle of trusted states in the EU, uh, with much smaller security services than the US, just a rounding error against the US numbers, managed to spy on practically all 7 billion human beings on Earth. If we assume that every American with any kind of clearance is actually a front for the NSA, that yields a ratio of one spook for every 1,400 people. 
Um, if we assume that only those with top secret clearance, which again would be a, a very large superset of NSA operatives, is fronting the NSA, it's a ratio of one spook to every 5,000 people under surveillance. Now, by contrast, the Stasi needed one spook for every 60 people. Right? They did it retail. It was artisanal surveillance. <laughs> Since 1990, the productivity gains of ICT have given spies a two order of magnitude lift in their surveillance capability. The Stasi used an army to surveil a nation. The NSA uses a battalion to surveil a planet. We tend to view NSA surveillance as a kind of extreme aberration because of the sheer number of people that it puts under surveillance. But maybe there's another explanation for how the NSA got here. Maybe they only modestly increased the resources and staff in their surveillance project. But because of ICT's incredible gifts to surveillance, roughly the same amount of effort gets them a geomet geome uh, geometric expansion in capacity. Indeed, since the end of the Cold War, the most fastest growing US surveillance apparatus has only grown fourfold. And most of them have grown much more modestly than that. But although they've increased their surveillance capacity uh, by more than 100-fold, they've made a relatively small investment since the end of the Cold War. Which brings us to a kind of existential question, which is why bother spying at all? Well, generally, sp states spy as part of a wider program of maintaining social stability. They worry that either internal or external forces will compromise the status quo, which will destabilize the state and endanger those for whom the state is viewed as legitimate, the people who think the state serves them well. For example, at the time of the Stasi, the leaders of the Soviet, of the Soviet states believed correctly that the US and NATO wanted to overturn not just their governments, but their very system of governance. They believed also correctly that there were people within their borders who shared this goal. And the same, of course, is true of autocratic states today. Um, you know, uh, as much as, as the um, Kim family are not very nice people, they aren't paranoid when they imagine that there's lots of people in North Korea who'd like to get rid of them. Um, and a few years ago, Syria was a really good example of this prior to the Civil War. Uh, although people of the country lived in enormous poverty, the Assad family enjoyed spectacular and widely publicized material wealth. They rang up huge iTunes bills. They bought couture clothes off the Paris runways. They shopped Chelsea for handmade furniture. They spent thousands circumventing, this is true, thousands circumventing the economic sanctions on their regime to import illegal copies of the last Harry Potter movie. <laughs> and this is also true in the United States. There are plenty of people who object not just to the current US government, but to America's system of governance. Um, there are domestic terrorists in America. There are populist movements in America. There are um, anti-authoritarian movements like Occupy in America. And of course, there are jihadists in America. And uh, um, they uh, all point to a state whose best served members have reason to fear that the prosperity that they receive, thanks to the status quo, that that prosperity is in danger. Right? That's, it's not wrong to believe that if you enjoy a lot of wealth that other people object to, and they'd like to get rid of that system, that your quality of life is threatened by those people. Right? You, it doesn't say anything about the legitimacy of their aims. It just says that that's true. Um, now, where does social stability come from? Generally speaking, people who feel well served by a state work for its continuance, or at least don't work against its continuance. And historically, states have used a combination of social programs and what the economist Samuel Bowles calls guard labor, uh, the coercive apparatus of surveillance, national armies, police, jails, and so forth, to attain social stability. Uh, states that have a lot of social programs don't need to spend as much on guard labor. You can think of the Nordic states. And states that have a lot of guard labor generally don't do as much redistribution, like Bahrain. Um, and, some, and most states use a mix of guard labor and, and social programs, like Saudi, where you have a certain class who get a lot of money from the oil fields, and then you have another class who are not citizens, but who are effectively long-term residents, even multi-generational guest arbiters who don't have those rights. But the guard labor and the legitimacy created by that larger pool of wealthy people, much like the middle class in, in Western states, where uh, even where there's a lot of poverty, that creates a legitimacy and a certain metastability. But now we live in an era of a, an expanding wealth gap. Uh, there is a profound economic inequality, both in and out of the Western states. The 400 richest Americans hold more wealth than the rest of the country combined, over 360 million people. And the majority of the richest Americans, uh, six of the Forbes top 10, inherited their wealth. 
which creates a picture of a kind of static dynastic form of government where the elites are uh, created by birth and not by virtue. Uh, the OECD says uh, wealth disparity is at its worth, worst in over 50 years, and the three richest people on earth have a net worth that's higher than the 48 poorest countries on earth combined. And these extreme wealth gaps are the source of real social instability. Uh, for example, real um, uh, uh, wealth gaps and power gaps uh, endanger evidence-based policy. In the old Soviet system, the best expression of that was Lysenkoism, where for political reasons, um, there was a scientist who had the ear of Stalin, Lysenko, who rejected uh, Darwinian selection, and who insisted that people could be perfected genetically through behavioral changes so that you could change people while they were alive and that those changes would be reflected in their germplasm and carry on to their children. This is obviously ideologically very attractive to the Stalinist project. And so they used it in wheat growing. You may remember the famines of the Stalinist era, tens of millions of people dead. That was Lysenko, right? If you can't adhere to, if, if, if evidence-based policy is inadmissible in your halls of power, then your state is destabilized because evidence uh, denying policy produces bad outcomes. That's why we do evidence-based policy. So modern states whose ruling elites depend on the denial of climate change can't have uh, policies that are grounded in the reality of climate change any more than states whose ruling elites are based on extremist religious doctrines that remain, demand the repression of women, can allow evidence-driven policies that point out the impact of industry on public life and on national prosperity of excluding 52% of the population from public life. And social instability is a threat to extreme wealth, right? The, the, your wealth is only as good as the guns surrounding it and the social consensus that you deserve it. Historically, there's been a hard limit on wealth inequality. The more unequal a society is, the more people within its borders and around the world question its legitimacy, and so the more it had to spend on guard labor. Eventually, it becomes cheaper to just redistribute some wealth than to keep paying for higher and higher walls. But we have a new status quo, an ICT supercharged surveillance status quo. Uh, the elites of the former Soviet bloc in, uh, enjoyed a tremendous wealth and privilege even during the darkest days of Stalin's famines. But remember, they had to pay for one spy for every 60 people, and arguably they were under-investing, because after all, the Stasi didn't know until the wall came down that it was about to come down. They weren't spying enough to figure out what was about to happen. If the Stasi could have given itself a two-order of magnitude efficiency boost, spend the same amount of money, and get 100 times more spying, uh, if every snitch could have watched 5,000 instead of 60 people, imagine how much more wealth the elites could have hoarded in their dashes. And we don't need to imagine it. You can look at countries like Ethiopia, one of the 48 least developed nations in the world, which has become a turnkey surveillance state. Although it has virtually no ICT capability domestically, it was able to go on the global market and buy NSA-grade surveillance capability for its ruling elites which has allowed those ruling elites to enjoy enormous privilege concentrated almost exclusively in the hands of government. And they have weaponized their security vulnerabilities, or more to the point, they've bought weaponized security vulnerabilities to attack their dissidents, including one, uh, Amer one uh, um, uh, permanent resident in the United States who is of Ethiopian origin and is an Ethiopian dissident who was attacked in Washington, D.C by an Ethiopian cyber weapon that they bought on the open market, which they used to spy on his Skype sessions to find out who he was communicating with back in Ethiopia. And there, he's presently suing the Ethiopian government in an American court. Global wealth disparity and the corruption it engenders are intimately bound up with the story of ICT. The ability of states to assert wholesale control at fire sale prices is a key factor in the ability of the wealth gap to spread as wide as it has. We are in a global arms race between ICT's power to spy uh, uh, and the appetites of elites to amass greater fortunes, poised against ICT's power to shield from surveillance and allow an effective dialogue about fairness and political change to grow without fear of reprisals. And this is profoundly worrying. An Internet of Things surveillance state will put the spies under your skin and literally inside your bed, in your toilet, and in your wallet. But conclu the conclusion isn't foreordained. Turing's legacy is with us. Cryptography works. It, in, in the same way that we find it very hard not to make Turing complete computers, we find it 
incredibly surprisingly easy to make ciphers that we can't figure out how to break, that no one can figure out how to break. In fact, it is the belief of modern cryptographers that using the computer in your pocket, you can scramble a message so thoroughly that if all the hydrogen atoms in the universe were turned to computers and did nothing from now until the universe ran out of energy but try to break that message, that it would never be able to render it unless you told them the key. So we have an unprecedented thing, a thing new on this earth, not just the ability to communicate with one another, which is itself a profound change in the politic, but to communicate with each other and ensure that only the people we choose to share our communications with get them. This is an amazing and astounding thing. In a corrupted world, the only sustainable policies must generate economic surplus for their beneficiaries who will use that economic surplus to lobby for the continuance of that policy. One of the reasons that Western governments spy is that spying is conducted through public-private partnerships. Companies like Booz Allen ex reap extraordinary windfall profits from surveilling on behalf of the NSA, which they use to lobby for the expansion of American surveillance. Um, every walled garden exists to extract monopoly rents for its proprietors, to make printer ink more expensive than champagne, to make 3D printer nylon more expensive than filet mignon, and as Amazon Jeff, uh, founder Jeff Bezos once said in more of his, one of his uh, more hippy-dippy moments, your margin is my opportunity. <laughs> the $10 billion that Apple takes, Apple takes in from the App Store is $10 billion that could be taken in by its rivals if they could operate their own competing App Stores. And they could use that uh, wealth to, to lobby to continue the policy of allowing people to know how their computers work, which is critical because when it's already illegal to install unapproved and transparent code on your devices, the states can introduce new modes of surveillance effectively for free. They can just quietly visit Apple and tell them that everything stolen in the apps in the App Store must from now on have surveillance backdoors, as apparently they did with Microsoft and Skype. The criminals will discover those backdoors. The autocratic regimes of the world will be able to buy access to those backdoors uh, on the open market. And because it's a felony to jailbreak your iPhone and install third-party code, those backdoors will endure. A walled garden is a panopticon and always must be a panopticon. Corporations and the states that they colonize each have a perverse incentive to make it impossible for users to prevent themselves from being spied upon. Walled gardens are the perfect model for a feudal style wealth disparity. Walled gardens allow manufacturers to arbitrarily change, disable, or modify what you can do with your things. You become a tenant of your ICT, not its owner. Um, in a walled gardens world, property is something that only the very powerful get, and everyone else gets a license. 22,000 words that you click I agree to and have never read because you know in your heart that what it says is, by being dumb enough to do this, you agree that we're allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother and wear your underwear and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge. Um, you know, and there is no better example of the expansion of this doctrine today than the streaming world where streaming, although it doesn't require that you not be able to save things, it's not as though you would sign up for Netflix, download the only three movies you ever want to watch, and then resign. Uh, nevertheless, they're committed to the idea that if you're streaming things, you're not downloading them, as though there was some kind of difference between streaming and downloading, as though there was a way for a file to be shown on your screen without it being downloaded to your computer. What they mean when they say, we are streaming this and not downloading it, is we think that your streaming client doesn't have a save button. And streaming has become so critical, this consensus hallucination has become so critical to the business models of the feudal internet that Netflix, the BBC, and other large streaming entities convinced the World Wide Web Consortium, which has historically been the staunchest ally we've had for open and free standards in the internet, they've inveigled them to introduce DRM as a standard feature of browsers to protect streaming media. With, and the very requirements for this standard are, are themselves a secret. You have to sign a non-disclosure to find out what the requirements are for this standard. And violating the standard will be a felony, as will reporting uh, vulnerabilities in, 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 uh, this, in devices that implement the standard. And that means that everything that's controlled by a browser will be illegal to know about the vulnerabilities in. Now, 
the fight here is not about cryptography, it's not about computers, it's not even about the Internet of Things. The real problems that we have today are much graver than that. We have things like climate change and sectarian conflict and vast economic disparity, corruption and poverty. But all of those fights, as important as they are, more important than any fight that we have about the Internet, all of those fights will be fought and won or lost on the Internet. So the policy questions raised by the Internet of Things aren't the most important questions. I know you wanted me to say that, but they're not the most important questions, but they're the most foundational questions. All of the other policy questions are contingent on how we answer the policy questions arising from the Internet of Things, on whether we believe that the default posture of our devices should be yes, master, or I can't let you do that, Dave. People ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist. Um, and, you know, I don't know that that's a, produ a productive question, because if I were optimistic about the future of our devices, and I thought that we had it within us to have the political will to make devices that were responsive to their users and treated their users as the uh, legitimate uh, creators of policy over them and not as adversaries, I would get up every morning and do everything I could to further that. And if I was pessimistic and I thought that the chances were slim and we were going to end up in a kind of horrific Orwellian nightmare by way of Kafka, by way of, uh, by way of Huxley, um, I would get up every morning and do exactly the same thing I would do if I were optimistic. So optimism and pessimism are a useful question. What's a more useful question is hope. And hope is why if your ship sinks in the middle of the sea, you tread water, not because you have a very good chance of being picked up, but because everyone who was rescued treaded water until someone came and picked them up. And if your ship sank in the middle of the sea and you're with people you loved, people who couldn't kick as hard as you, you wouldn't let them sink. You'd hold on to them and kick twice as hard. And those of us who think about these issues, we are surrounded by people, our children, our parents, people around us who are not as clued into these technological issues, who are going to be sub as subject to the outcomes of these fights as we are. And I have enough hope to do everything I can to try and influence those outcomes. And the fact that my neighbors haven't yet picked up on how important this is isn't cause for despair. It's cause to quit kick twice as hard. So with that, I'll thank you and entertain your questions. Thank you.